This is the fourth day of the July 89 seven day retreat in spring water. I would like to use most of the time of this talk today about what is questioning and how does one question one's thinking. This has raised many questions with many different people. But before we go into that, just briefly about something I said yesterday. the comment someone made in a meeting about it. It was when I was talking about being invited to participate in a counseling meeting where the topic that the leaders introduced was to stop feeling that one is unimportant and to begin seeing oneself as important or thinking about oneself as being important discontinuing thinking about oneself as being unimportant. The, the words I'm using are mine. I don't remember verbatim how it was put, but that was the gist of it. And I use the word brainwashing the reason that word was used was because it appeared like wanting to wash out one image out of the mind and replace it with another. Now, it's always a dangerous thing to use loaded words because brainwashing is, has become a loaded word associated with torturous political maneuvers trying to indoctrinate people who have been otherwise indoctrinated with a new set of ideology under duress. We didn't go into that, but the person said, what, hypothetically speaking, what if a, someone had come to that meeting who was suicidal because of deep negativity about himself or herself, feeling totally worthless, no good, and attending that meeting, hearing about it, and maybe some of that operation being successful there, leaving the meeting feeling that there is some importance to one, and therefore not taking one's life. then wouldn't that have been worthwhile? And in thinking about it, looking at it, I'm not critical of people going to therapies and therapies taking place to help people, prevent people from taking their lives or help people to think in whatever way about themselves. That, that's what's going on, and many people tell me that at a certain stage in their life that has been helpful, or they're doing it right now and say it's helpful to a certain extent. I may have sounded critical about that. What I was looking at and using this example for is that no matter what image we carry, with us about ourselves, what image we are attached to, that image is, brings conflict and problems. One may have learned to think well about oneself and then someone does not, someone puts one down. 
criticizes one, ridicules one, humiliates one. And the old hurt flares up, the hurt of me. What I would like to be and what I'm not taken as being. I could talk much more about this, but today we will talk about thinking, which has to do with this too. We were, we were questioning whether there is need for any self-image, which does not mean that people who need to tell themselves uh, positive things about themselves shouldn't be doing that. I never say, don't do this, or this shouldn't happen. I'm looking at it. What does it do? Not just temporarily or uh, for the moment, but also in the long run. Why are we frustrated, angry, hurt people? And out of that frustration, anger and hurt, need to hurt others. Why do we have enemies? And what is the face of the enemy? It's an image. A thought. And the, the brain, the human brain, has this capacity to form images of oneself and each other and act on those images. Never questioning whether, or rarely questioning, whether the image really tells the truth about oneself and the person or the nation, the group that one is, that one sees as one's adversary or enemy or rival. This is the capacity of thought to do that and the power of thought to affect us deeply, to act in most irrational ways to the point of taking our own or other people's lives. And unless this functioning of thought and its immense power on the human mind and body and action is understood, we will most likely continue in warfare, in division, dividing ourselves up and away from each other, failing to see our common humanity because we are fixated upon the image of me, my group, and you, and your, the likes of you. So, with this we will go, go into the, the main question for today, which is, what is questioning? What do you mean when you talk about questioning? particularly questioning thinking. And let me just mention different comments that have been made in meetings about this. None of what I'm saying now is remembered verbatim. Therefore, I may not state precisely what has been said. It may also be the result of combining what several people have said and a new statement emerging. So please don't feel in retrospect that you have misunderstood, has have been misunderstood, because it's not verbatim quoted. One, one person said, when I come here, I feel such immense joy, peace, lightness, that I'm not interested in questioning anger or fear.
I'm much more interested in this, in this dropping away of all the fears and, and anger or whatever problems I may have brought here. One person said, I'm not interested in looking at things scientifically. You imply a, a value in this looking scientifically at what is going on in the mind. I rather remain with the mystery of everything. The, un, the mystery is what the person said. implying looking at something scientifically may destroy that mystery. And I hope I'll remember to come back to what I mean when I say looking at something as though scientifically. Because I don't mean analysis by that. Maybe I'll say it right away because I may forget it. What I mean is seeing a fact as a fact without idea about it. Because idea hides fact. And also the, the interest, the, the interest in finding out what something is when ideas are in the background or quiet. Ideas which have loomed so large and have hidden what what actually is going on in the mind or outside of us. To look at it and be willing to, to drop ideas if something turns out to be otherwise. And the joy of discovery, at discovering what is so, which does not explain the mystery of life that remains untouched. No, no scientific endeavor will ever explain that. We can only explain f parts, small parts, with at, at the end realizing there's so much more that we don't know. Every article in, almost in Scientific American ends that way. This is what we know now, but there's so much more that we don't know, of course, often. It says, but we will know more. There's maybe the hope among scientists one day to explain everything, <laughs> but it's, it's absolutely impossible. Because thought and knowledge are limited. limited to the very instruments. Every time a new instrument, new knowledge, different knowledge. But we don't have to go into that. One person said, the more I try to question my thoughts, particularly the peripheral thoughts, that are constantly in the mind, the more I try to question them, the more the thoughts multiply. There are more thoughts in questioning thoughts. And another person said, the more I investigate into a state of discomfort, dis-ease, The more I question into that, the more I seem to be strengthening the sense of self. So what is questioning? What do we mean by questioning? Because we do not mean analyzing multiplying thoughts. 
strengthening the sense of self, destroying the mystery of life, or interfering with the joy and, and, and lightness of being here. What do we mean by questioning? I think one essential feature of this questioning is not knowing what something is, sort of a switch from knowing all about it through memory, ideas, what one has learned, to wondering what something is directly, immediately, as it occurs. The brook rushing by, a tree moving in the breeze, a flower, or a, a, the momentum of anger arising, or the, the anguish elicited by a memory. it is possible to listen to the stream, to see the tree, the clouds, smell the earth, the flowers, the buzzing of the, of the insects, the twittering of the birds, if that's all there, with the immediacy of no, no division, no distance. then there's no need to question. Then everything is clear and revealed for what it is. And yet the thought may so instantly arise, I'm really doing well at this. I've got it. I want to hold on to this feeling. I don't want to lose it. Does one notice that? It may be a very subtle thought. The thought creating the experiencer of all of what is going on. Me experiencing that, me having that experience. thinking subtly about having that experience, how marvelous it is, how one wants to continue with it and keep it, creates the sense of me separate from what is surrounding me. And we're asking, can that be questioned? By questioning meaning, first of all, coming into, that it comes into awareness. That there are these thoughts and that the thought does indeed create a separation. <clears throat> and then if one is at all interested, and this is not imposed upon anyone, it's up to each one of us, whether we want to find out what is this experiencer, Is there, in fact, the division that seems to be there? Me having the experience of listening to a bird. One may not be interested or, or, or not want to go into them. That's up to each one. 
at a joyful moment, a moment of peace or great exuberance and ecstasy. This sense of me as the experiencer who has this, if it's indeed there, it may not be there. But if it is there, it doesn't create any noticeable problems for one. And that's why at such moments we may be disinclined to to pause, to pause and look and listen and question. Questioning here, not meaning raising thoughts about this thing, but becoming aware that there is implicit thought, that I am having this experience. And the the effect of the thought on the on the whole organism, wanting more of it, wanting to keep it, wanting to remember it, afraid of losing it. What is this I? What is this me? There is a separate organism, legs walking up and down the hill. Not just legs. (laughs) But there can be the walking up and down the hill, the smelling of the fragrance of, of all the flowers and whatever all is fragrant, the sound of all, whatever is heard. touch of coolness or hot or heat on the skin, sight of the, of the valleys and hills, blue or pink, whatever the time of day. And no sense of me, no sense of separation, no sense of wanting, no sense of fearing. sense of, am I fortunate to, to, to feel that way? The thought may come up, but it may be instantly seen and not gel into this entity who has this, has this good fortune. And one cannot assume that there is freedom from duality in oneself when there is some awareness. We've, we've just now in this present newsletter published an extensive correspondence with a person who has done meditation, Zen, meditative inquiry for some 20 years. And only, recent, <coughs> only recently Interestingly enough, while doing therapy, therapeutic counseling, discovered, as he puts it in his own words, how much I censored out of my awareness in order to remain and feel, to continue to feel and appear attentive. A disturbance arising in such a state may be instantly and habitually squelched, controlled, in order not to disrupt this blissful state of awareness. And I'm not advocating that one, advocating, I'm not advocating that one start now digging. That comes up in this correspondence too start digging for things. It's not necessary. It all depends on what is the state of awareness. Is it really open and unself-centered? Then stuff from the unconscious mind will percolate up. A thought will bring up memory of something fearful or something anger arousing. It doesn't have to be dug for. But 
if there is a self-center in this state of blessed awareness, a controller, then that controller will keep things out of the way so as not to disturb, not to rock the boat. And there's the openness of, of inquiry, not inquiring into anything, just what is the openness of what is everything? Not having any fixed point of view, not any fixed attitude, not holding on to being something or something continuing, not wanting something continue and not wanting something to end, not wanting, just the openness. The openness of the openness and quietness of the conscious mind, which is this controller, then things will bubble up from the from the deeper layers of the consciousness. When there are moments of inattention, which are which come and go all the time. Now, one, one person saying, I can tell that there are, even though the state of mind is one of listening, being aware of sensations in the body, listening, the sounds, birds, and insects, yet there is also awareness that there are some thoughts in the background. And since you're always talking about look at your thoughts, as I'm trying to look at them, I find thoughts are multiplying. And the state of open listening is gone. So what is happening? Is one getting involved in the content of thought? which means thinking going on, capturing the mind, thinking, which was in the background first, but now more aware of what one was thinking about and then getting captivated in that. Is that what's going on, which is the multiplication of thoughts? As we were looking at that together, it wasn't so much that. What came up was I remember right one didn't really want those thoughts in the back of the mind. There was a thought I shouldn't have those thoughts, or I should look at those thoughts so that they disappear, which is the multiplication of thoughts, about thoughts. The, the main thought, I shouldn't have thoughts, or I should look at thoughts. But awareness of thoughts, either peripheral or wherever they are, is not a should, is not something one should do. It reveals what's there. And then the conditioned thought comes up, what should I do about what is there? Can one instantly see this as another thought and not act on it? There's nothing one should do. Awareness is totally sufficient unto itself. It doesn't require any action of will, intention, but it can shed light on will coming up. I must do something about this. 
and then the whole organism involved in this intention and willing, all of this can come into awareness without doing anything, just by being openly interested in what is going on in this so heavily conditioned mind and body. And as we were talking about it, it became very clear that the moment thoughts are pursued with, the, with any kind of intention to clarify them, to get rid of them, then the, the openness and breadth and depth of listening narrows down to this thinking chamber. With all of its compulsion and fears of failing to do it, or the success of having controlled the thoughts, which is still thought. Is this difficult to follow? To, to move with? And it may not be everyone's concern at this moment, maybe the next moment. The person who said, I have a feeling of discomfort, there is a feeling of dis-ease. And in looking at it, in questioning it, I feel I'm strengthening the sense of self. Again, looking at it together, what revealed itself that there is the intention to be done with this feeling of dis-ease, to get rid of it. So the looking and, and wondering is already under the sponsorship of a thought. It's no good. I want to be done with it. I want to overcome it, be free of it. And obviously, that strengthens the sense of self. What I need to accomplish, what I'm going to accomplish, maybe what I have accomplished. If for some reason the feeling of dis-ease disappears through some action of will or control. Questioning and inquiring into something is not to, to get a result, the result of overcoming it or get, gaining peace and joy. It is wondering about stuff that's there hemming us in on all sides, isolating us from each other, dividing us up. Causing conflict and sorrow in human beings. And we're asking freshly, Right now, can there be understanding of what divides us, hems us in, narrows us down, frustrates us, makes us angry, fearful, aggressive, violent? Someone said, this is what I do in therapy when I see my therapist. <coughs> Here, this is something different, isn't it? This is not therapy, is it? I really don't know what it is. But 
if a thought, a memory has brought the, the body into a state of anguish, it's there, it's operating. It, it disturbs the balance of the body and it issues new thoughts. I don't want to feel this way. What choice is there but to be with what, what's there without controlling it, without analyzing it, just wondering about it. That's what we mean by questioning. What is it? And allow it to, to speak, to reveal itself, to unfold. Not pushing it to do that. Not knowing what will be the result of, of wondering about the state of, one will not even call it anguish anymore. Call it nothing. Not call it anything. Just in touch with the tension. One doesn't need to localize it, say it's tension in my abdomen or so. That's already knowledge. Just in touch with it, not knowing where or why. the movement of thought that issues from it. This will get worse. Will I have this for the rest of my life? Hearing those thoughts, we talk to ourselves all the time. And one can listen in and hear what one is saying to oneself about oneself or to someone else about oneself. And if in, in such complete, unconditional listening to what's happening or being in touch with what's there. The tension, the pain, the fear, whatever. Here I'm using words, but one needs no words for this. Because what is happening throughout the organism is wordless. It, it, it's actual. It's real. The words are an abstraction from it. If there's this unconditional, no separation, then that state changes. It's no longer the same as it was when we thought, worried, or willed about it. It fixates it or, or gives it energy. But an unconditional, huh? It and the listening, listening to unpleasantness or pain without escaping, which is possible. We may think it's not possible, but it's entirely possible. Then that state changes. May even wither away, dissipate altogether. Given patience. And no, no interference with it. So then the question comes up for some people. What practice do you recommend for doing what you just talked about? <clears throat> Don't we need a practice for that? I don't think I understand practice anymore the way 
We all, many of us, used to do it. Something repetitive, suggesting something to oneself. Fixating, concentrating the mind on something, and with that a calming down of the mind. If body and mind, one's whole being is, is really interested, needing to find out about what is happening in this body-mind, needing to, to listen to it firsthand, <coughs> not via any, anything, anybody, any technique, any theory or doctrine, directly first hand for oneself, then there is a quieting down in the, in the need to listen. In the need to be with whatever's there. What is extraneous to it, sort of filters out by itself. Just as we've so often spoke, spoken about it, if we, if we walk together down, down the, the road and come to that brook, and both of us, <coughs> both of us want to listen to the sound of the water gushing over the rocks, both be quiet. We'll just stand there quietly, silently, and motionlessly. Listening to the sound of the birds. Doesn't, doesn't the body-mind quiet down if one needs to listen? It's so clear that being in touch with what's actually there, that's being alive. But being ignorant of what is actually there and going on, on ideas and principles, that's not being fully alive. And not only not fully alive, but dangerous. Because we create each other as friends and enemies. We will end here for today.